The Chronicles of Prydane by Lloyd Alexander. Book 5 The High King. Chapter 20 The Gift. They were home again. Gwydion had led the companions westward to the coast where the golden ships waited. From there, with Ka proudly perched on the highest mast, the great vessels with their gleaming sails bore them to Arvin Harbor. Word of Arn's destruction had spread swiftly, and even as the companions disembarked, many cantrip lords and their battle horse gathered to follow the Sons of Dawn, to do hom homage to King Gwydion and to cry greetings to the Comet folk and Taran Wanderer. Gurgi unfurled what remained of the banner of the white pig and raised it triumphantly. Yet Gwydion was strangely silent, and Taran, as the little farm came into sight, felt more heartache than joy. The winter had broken, thawing earth had begun to stir, and the first hardly visible traces of green touched the hills like a faint mist. But Taran's eyes went to Call's empty garden, and he grieved afresh for the stout grower of turnips far distant in his lonely resting place. Dalbin hobbled out to greet them. The enchanter's face had grown even more deeply lined. His brow seemed fragile, the wrinkled skin almost transparent. Seeing him, Taran sensed that Dalbin already knew Call would not return. Ilanwe ran to his outstretched arms. Taran, leaping from the back of Malinlis, strode after her. Ka flapped his wings and gabbled at the top of his voice. Fluider, Dolly, and Gurgi, who looked more than ever patchy and scraggly, hastened to add their greetings, attempting to tell Dalbin, all at the same time, what had befallen them. Henwin was squealing, grunting, and wheezing, and very nearly climbing over the bars of the pen. As Taran jumped into the enclosure to fling his arms about the delighted pig, he suddenly heard shrill squealings and his jaw dropped in surprise. Ilanwe, who had hurried to the enclosure, gave a joyful cry. Piglets! Six small pigs, five white as Henwin and one black, stood squealing on their hind legs beside their mother. Henwin chuckled and grunted proudly. Yeah, we have had visitors, said Dalbin. Yeah, one of them a very handsome boar. Yeah, during the winter, when there was much stirring among the forest creatures, he came seeking food and shelter and found Ker Dalbin more to his liking than the woods. Yeah. He is roaming about somewhere now, for he is still a little wild and unused to so many new arrivals. Yeah. Great villain, cried Fluider. Seven oracular pigs. Taran, my friend, your tasks will be harder than they were in the hills of Brangaleed. Dalbin shook his head. Yeah. Sturdy and healthy they are, and a finer letter as I have seen. <laughs> but their powers are no greater than those of any other pig, which should be quite enough to satisfy them. And when own gift began to fade when the letter stick shattered, and now is gone past recall. It is for the best. Such powers a heavy burden for men as well as pigs, and I dare say she is much happier now. <laughs> For two days, the companions rested, grateful and content to be together in the peacefulness of the little farm. The sky had never seemed clear, filled with happier promise of spring or greater joy. King Smite had arrived with his guard of honor, and through a night's feasting, the cottage rang with merriment. Next day, Dalbin summoned the companions to his chamber, where Gwydion and Taliesin already waited. He peered deeply and kindly at all gathered there, and when he spoke, his voice was gentle. Uh, these have been days of welcome, he said, uh, but also days of farewell. Uh. A questioning murmur rose from the companions. Taran, with alarm, looked searchingly at Dalbin. Fluider, however, clapped a hand to his sword and exclaimed, I knew it would be so! What task remains to be done? Have the Gwythanes returned? Is a band of huntsmen still abroad? Have no fears! A flam stands ready! Gwydion smiled sadly at the excited bard. Not so, gallant friend. Like the huntsmen, the Gwythanes have been destroyed. Yet it is true, one task remains. 
the sons of dawn, their kinsmen and kinswomen, must board the golden ships and set sail for the summer country, the land from which we came. Taran turned to Gwydion as though he had not grasped the High King's words. How then? he quickly asked, not daring to believe he had heard aright. The sons of dawn leave Prydain? Must you sail now? To what purpose? How soon shall you return? Shall you not first rejoice in your victory? Our victory is itself the reason for our voyage, Gwydion answered. This is a destiny long ago laid upon us. When the Lord of Anuvan shall be overcome, then must the sons of dawn depart forever from Prydain. No! Ilanwe protested. Not now of all times! We cannot turn from this ancient destiny, Gwydion replied. King Fluider Flam, too, must join us, for he is kin to the House of Dawn. The bard's face filled with distress. A Flam is grateful, he began. And under ordinary circumstances, I should look forward to a sea voyage, but I'm quite content to stay in my own realm. Indeed, dreary though it is, I found myself rather missing it. Taliesin spoke then. It is not for you to choose, son of Godo, but know that the summer country is a fair land, fairer even than Prydain, and one where all heart's desires are granted. Lion shall be with you. A new harp you shall have. I myself shall teach you the playing of it, and you shall learn all the lore of the bards. Your heart has always been the heart of a true bard, fluid or flam. Until now, it was unready. Have you given up what? Have you given up that which you loved most for the sake of your companions? The harp that awaits you shall be all the more precious, and its strings shall never break. Know this too, Taliesin added. All men born must die, save those who dwell in the summer country. It is a land without strife or suffering, where even death itself is unknown. <laughs> Yeah, there is yet another destiny laid upon us, Dalvin said. As the sons of dawn must return to their own land, so must there come an end to my own powers. I have long pondered the message Henwin's last letter stick might have given us. It is clear to me now why the ash rods shattered. They could not withstand such a prophecy, which could only have been this. Not only shall the flame of Drinwin be quenched and its power vanish, but all enchantments shall vanish and pass away, and men unaided guide their own destiny. I, too, voyage to the summer country. Continue, Dalbin continued. I do so with sorrow, but with even greater joy. I am an old man and weary. And for me, there shall be rest in a laying down of burdens, which have grown all too heavy upon my shoulders. Dolly, alas, must return to the realm of the fair folk, and so must Ka, the enchanter went on. The wayposts are being abandoned. King Idleg will soon command the barring of all passages into his kingdom just as Medwin has already closed his valley forever to the race of men, allowing only the animals to find their way to him. Dolly bowed his head. Humph, he snorted. It's about time to stop dealing with mortals. Dolly leads to trouble. Yes, I'll be glad enough to go back. Uh, I've had my fill of good old Dolly this and good old Dolly that. And good old Dolly, would you mind turning invisible just once more? <laughs> the dwarf strove to look as furious as he could, but there were tears in his bright red eyes. Even the Princess Ilanwe, daughter of Ongrad, must voyage to the summer country, Dalbin said. So it must be, he went on as Ilanwe gasped in disbelief. <laughs> That Kirkalur, the princess gave up only the usage of her magical powers. Uh, they are still within her, as they have been handed down to all daughters of the House of Lear. Uh, therefore must she depart. Uh, however, he went on quickly, before Ilanwe could interrupt, uh, there are others who have well served the sons of Dawn, faithful Gurgi, 
Hen went too in her own fashion, and Taran of Caerdalban. It is their reward that they may journey with us. Yeah. Yes, yes, shouted Gurgi. Oh, go to land of no signs and no dyings. <laughs> he bounded joyously and waved his arms in the air, shedding a good portion of what hair remained to him. Yes, yes, all together forever, and Gurgi too will find what he seeks. Wisdom for his poor tender head! <laughs> Taran's heart leaped as he cried out Ilanwe's name and hastened to the side of the princess to take her in his arms. We shall not part again. In the summer country, we shall be wed. Uh, he stopped short. If, if that is your wish, if you will wed an assistant pig keeper. Well, indeed, replied Ilanwe. I wondered if you'd ever get around to asking. Of course I will. And if you'd gotten half a thought to the question, you'd have already known my answer. Taran's head still spun from the enchanter's tiding, and he turned to Dalbin. Can this be true, that Ilanwe and I may voyage together? Dalbin said nothing for a moment, then he nodded. Eh, it is true. No greater gift lies in my power to grant. Glue snorted. That's all very well, bestowing never-ending life left and right, even on a pig. But no one's given a thought to me. Selfishness, lack of consideration. It's plain that if that fair folk mine hadn't come tumbling down, robbing me of my fortune, I might add, we'd have taken a different path. We never have gone to Mount Dragon. Dreamwood would never have been found. The cauldron born never slain. For all his indignation, however, the former giant's brow puckered wretchedly and his lips trembled. Go, by all means. Let me stay this ridiculous size. I assure you, when I was a giant. Yes, yes! Gurgi shouted, whining giant to us served, even as he says, it is not fair to leave him alone and lost in smallness, and in treasure house of evil death lord, when all rich treasures fall in flames, a life was saved from hot and hurtful blazons. <laughs> yes, even glue has served, though all unwitting, Dalbin replied. His reward shall be no less than yours. In the summer country he may grow, if he so desires, to the stature of a man. But do you tell me, Dalbin said, looking sternly at Gurgi, that he saved your life? Gurgi hesitated a moment. Before he could answer, Glue quickly spoke. Of course he didn't, said the former giant. A life was saved. Mine. If he hadn't pulled me out of the treasure house, I'd be no more than a cinder in a new thing. At least you've told the truth, giant! cried Fluider. Good for you! Great Bellin! I think you've already grown a little taller! Gwydion stepped forward and gently put his hand on Taran's shoulder. Our time is soon upon us, he said quietly. In the morning we shall depart. Make ready, assistant pig keeper. That night, Taran drowsed fitfully. The joy that so lightened his heart had strangely flown, fluttering out of reach like a bird of brilliant plumage he could not lure back to his hand. Even thoughts of Ilanwe, of happiness awaiting them in the summer country, could not regain it. At last, he rose from his pallet and stood uneasy by the chamber window. The campfires of the Sons of Dawn had burned to ashes. The full moon turned the sleeping fields to a sea of silver. From far beyond the hills, a voice began to lift in song, faint but clear. Another joined it, then still others. Taran caught his breath. Only once, long ago in the fair folk realm, had he heard such singing. Now, more beautiful than he remembered, the song swelled in a long flood of melody shimmering brighter than the moonbeams. Suddenly it ended. Taran cried out in sorrow, knowing he would never hear its like again. And, perhaps in his own imaginings, there echoed from every corner of the land the sound of heavy portals closing. 
What? Sleepless, my chicken? Said a voice behind him. He turned quickly. Light filling the chamber dazzled him. But as his vision cleared, he saw three tall and slender figures, two garbed in robes of shifting colors of white, gold, and flaming crimson, and one hooded in a cloak of glittering black. Gems sparkled in the tresses of the first. At the throat of the second hung a necklace of shining white beads. Taran saw their faces were calm, beautiful to heartbreak. And though the dark hood shadowed the features of the last, Taran knew she could be no less fair. Mm, sleepless and speechless, too, said the middle figure. Mm, tomorrow, poor dear, instead of dancing with joy, he'll be yawning. Your voices, I know them well. Torrin stammered, barely able to speak above a whisper. But your faces, yes, once I have seen them, a time long past in the marshes of Morva, yet it cannot be the same. Ordu, Orwin, and Orgok? Mm, of course we are, my gosling, Ordu replied. Though it's true, whenever you met us before, we were hardly at our best. Mm. But good enough for the purpose, Orgok muttered from the depths of her hood. Orwin giggled girlishly and toyed with her beads. You mustn't think we look like ugly old hags all the time, she said. Only when the circumstances seem to require it. Why have you come? Tarn began, still baffled at the familiar tones of the enchantresses coming from their fair shapes. Do you too journey to the summer country? Ordu shook her head. We are journeying, but not with you. Salt air makes Orgot queasy, though it's very likely the only thing that does. We travel to, well, anywhere. You might even say everywhere. You shall see no more of us, nor we of you, added Orwin, almost regretfully. We shall miss you. As much, as, that is, as we can miss anyone. Orgok especially would have loved to, well, best not to dwell on that. Orgok gave a most ungentle snort. Ordu, meanwhile, had unfolded a length of brightly woven tapestry and held it out to Taran. We came to bring you this, my duckling, she said. Take it and pay no heed to Orgok's grumbling. She'll have to swallow her disappointment, for lack of anything better. I have seen this on your loom, Taran said, more than a little distrustful. Why do you offer it to me? I do not ask for it, nor can I pay for it. Mm, it is yours by right, my robin, answered Ordu. Mm, it does come from our loom, if you insist on strictest detail. Mm, but it was really you who wove it. Puzzled, Tarn looked more closely at the fabric and saw it crowded with images of men and women, of warriors and battles, of birds and animals. These, he murmured and wondered, these are of my own life. Mm, of course, Ordu replied. The pattern is of your choosing and always was. My choosing? Tarn questioned. Not yours? Yet I believed... He stopped and raised his eyes at Ordu. Yes, he said slowly. Once I did believe the world went at your bidding. I see now it is not so. The strands of life are not woven by three hags or even by three beautiful damsels. The pattern indeed was mine. But here, he added, frowning as he scanned the final portion of the fabric where the weaving broke off and the threads fell unraveled. Here it is unfinished. Naturally, said Ordu. You must still choose the pattern, and so must each of you poor perplexed fledglings, as long as thread remains to be woven. But no longer do I see mine clearly, Taran cried. No longer do I understand my own heart. Why does my grief shadow my joy? Tell me this much. Give me to know this as one last boon. <laughs> Dear chicken said Ordu, smiling sadly. When, in truth, did we really give you anything? Then they were gone. 
The Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Book 5, The High King. Chapter 21, Farewells. Through the remainder of the night, Tarn did not move from the window. The unfinished weaving lay at his feet. By dawn, a still greater number of comet folk and Cantrev nobles came to throng the fields and hillsides around Cairdalban, for it had become known the sons of dawn were departing Prydain, and with them the daughters of dawn who had journeyed from the eastern strongholds. At last, Tarin stirred and made his way to Dalbin's chamber. The companions were already gathered, even Doley, who had flatly refused to set out for the fair folk realm without taking a last leave of each and every friend. Ka, quiet for once, perched on the dwarf's shoulder. Glue seemed excited and pleased to be on his way. Talison and Gwydion stood near Dalbin, who had donned a heavy travel cloak and bore an ashwood staff. Under his arm, the enchanter carried the Book of Three. Kindly Master, hasten! shouted Gurgi as Lion at flew at her side twitched her tail impatiently. All are ready for floatings and boatings! Taran's eyes went to the faces of the companions, to Ilanwe, who was watching him eagerly, to the weathered faces of Gwydion and the face of Dalbin, furrowed with wisdom. Never had he loved each of them more than at this moment. He did not speak until he came to stand before the old enchanter. Never shall I have greater honor than the gift you offer me, Tarin said. The words came slowly, yet he forced himself to continue. Last night, my heart was troubled. I dreamed that Ordu... No, it was not a dream. She was indeed here, and I have seen for myself your gift is one I cannot take. Gurgi's yelping stopped short, and he stared at Tarn with wide and unbelieving eyes. The companions started, and Ilanwe cried out, Tarin of Cairdolben, you have any idea what you're saying? Has the flame of Drinwin scorched your wits? Suddenly, her voice caught in her throat. She bit her lips and turned quickly away. Oh, I understand. In the summer country, we were to be wed. Do you still question my heart? It is not changed. It is your heart that has changed toward mine. Taran dared not look at Ilanwe, for his grief was too keen in him. You are wrong, Princess of Lear, he murmured. I have long loved you, and loved you even before I knew that I did. If my heart breaks to part from our companions, it breaks twice over to part from you. Yet so it must be. I cannot do otherwise. Think carefully, Assistant Pigkeeper, Dalbin said sharply. Once taken, your choice cannot be recalled. Will you dwell in sorrow instead of happiness? Will you refuse not only joy and love, but never-ending life? Tarn did not answer for a long moment. When at last he did, his voice was heavy with regret, yet his words were clear and unfaltering. There are those more deserving of your gift than I, yet never may it be offered them. My life is bound to theirs. Colson of Kalfluer's garden and orchard lie barren, waiting for a hand to quicken them. My skill is less than his, but I give it willingly for his sake. The seawall at Dinas Rednant is unfinished, Tarn continued. Before the King of Mona's burial mound, I vowed not to leave his task undone. From his jacket, Tarn drew the fragment of pottery. Shall I forget Anlaw Clay Shaper, Comet Mirin, and others like it? I cannot restore life to Linneo, son of Lonwin, and those valiant folk who followed me, never to see their homes again. Nor can I mend the hearts of widows and orphan children. If it is in my power to rebuild even a little of what has been broken, this I must do. The Red Fallows once were a fruitful place. With labor, perhaps they shall be so again. He turned and spoke to Taliesin. Care Dathiel's proud halls lie in ruins, and with them the hall of lore and the treasured wisdom of the bards. Have you not said that memory lives longer than what is remembered? But what if memory be lost? If there are those who will help me, we will raise the fallen stones and regain the treasure of memory. Gurgi will help! 
He will not voyage. No, no. Gurgi wailed. He stays always. And he wants no gift that takes him from Kindly Master. Taran put a hand on the creature's arm. <laughs> you must journey with the others. Do you call me master? Obey me then in one last command. Find the wisdom you yearn for. It awaits you in the summer country. Whatever I may find, I must seek it here. I longly bowed her head. You have chosen as you must, Taran of Kirdolvin. <laughs> Nor will I gainsay you. Dalbin said to Taran, but only warn you, the tasks you set yourself are cruelly difficult. There is no certainty you will accomplish even one, and much risk you will fail in all of them. In either case, your efforts may well go unrewarded, unsung, forgotten. And at this end, like all mortals, you must face your death. Perhaps without even a mound of honor to mark your resting place. Yeah. Taran nodded. So be it, he said. Long ago, I yearned to be a hero without knowing in truth what a hero was. Now, perhaps, I understand it a little better. A grower of turnips or a shaper of clay, a comet farmer or a king. Every man is a hero if he strives more for others than for himself alone. Once, he added, you told me that the seeking counts more than the finding. So too must the striving count more than the gain. Once I hoped for a glorious destiny, Tarn went on, smiling at his own memory. That dream has vanished with my childhood. And though a pleasant dream, it was fit only for a child. I am well content as an assistant pig keeper. <laughs> Even that contentment shall not be yours, Dalman said. No longer are you assistant pig keeper, but high king of Friday. Taran caught his breath and stared with disbelief at the enchanter. You jest with me, he murmured. Have I been prideful that you would mock me by calling me king? Your worth was proved when you drew Drinwen from its sheath, Dalman said. And your kingliness when you chose to remain here. It is not a gift I offer you now, but a burden far heavier than any you have borne. Then why must I bear it? cried Taran. I am an assistant pig keeper, and such have I always been. It has been written in the Book of Three, Dalban answered, and he raised his hand for silence before Taran could speak again. I dared not tell you this. Uh, to give you such knowledge would have defeated the prophecy itself. Uh, until this very moment, I was not sure you were the one chosen to rule. Uh, indeed, yesterday I feared you were not. How then? Turin asked. Could the Book of Three deceive you? Uh, no, it could not, Dalbin said. Uh, the Book of... The book is thus called because it tells all three parts of our lives. The past, the present, and the future. But it could as well be called the book of if. If you had failed at your tasks. If you had followed an evil path. If you had been slain. If you had not chosen as you did. A thousand ifs, my boy. And many times a thousand. The Book of Three can say no more than if, until at the end, of all things that might have been, one alone becomes what really is. For the deeds of a man, not the words of a prophecy, are what shape his destiny. I understand now why you kept my parentage a secret, Tarrant said. But shall I never be given to know it? I did not keep it secret from you entirely through my own wish, Dolben answered, nor do I keep it so now. Long ago, when the Book of Three first came into my hands, from its pages I learned that when the Sons of Dawn departed from Prydane, the High King would be one who slew a serpent, who gained and lost a flaming sword, who chose a kingdom of sorrow over a kingdom of happiness. These prophecies were clouded, even to me, 
and darkest was the prophecy that who he who would come to rule Prydane would be one of no situation in life. Long I did I ponder these things, Dalbin continued. Yeah. At last I left Kir Dalbin to seek this future king and to hasten his coming. For many years I searched, yet all whom I questioned well knew their station, whether shepherd or war leader, cantrib lord or comet farmer. Yeah. The seasons turned, kings rose and fell, wars turned to peace and peace to war. Yeah. Indeed, on a certain time, as many years ago, as you yourself have years, a grievous war was fought upon the land, and I despaired of my quest and turned my steps once more toward Ker Dalbin. On that day, I chanced to pass a field where a battle had raged. Many lay slain, noble as well as humble folk. Even the women and children had not been spared. From the forest nearby, I heard a piercing cry. An infant had been hidden among the trees, as though his mother had sought, at the last, to keep him safe. From his wrappings, I could judge nothing of his parentage, and only sensed with certainty that both mother and father lay upon that field of the slain. Here, surely, was one with no station in life, an unknown babe of unknown kin. I bore the child with me to care Dalbin. The name I gave him was Tarin. I could not have told you of your parentage, even had I wished to, Dalbin continued, for I knew it no more than you did. My secret hope I shared only with two others, Lord Gwydion and Call. As you grew to manhood, so our hopes grew. Though never could we be certain you were the child born to be High King. Yeah, until now, my boy, said Dalbin, you were always a great perhaps. What was written has come to pass, Gwydion said, and now in truth we must say farewell. The chamber was silent. Lion, sensing the bard's distress, nuzzled him gently. The companions did not move. It was Glue who stepped forward and spoke first. <clears throat> I've been carrying this with me ever since I was so shabbily hustled away from Mona, he said, drawing from his jacket a small blue crystal which he pressed into Taran's hand. It reminded me of my cavern in those grand days when I was a giant. But for some reason, I don't want to be reminded of them any longer. Since I don't want it, here, take it as a small remembrance of me. He's still hardly the most generous spirit in the world, muttered Fluider. But I've no doubt it's the first time he's ever given anybody anything. Great Bella, I swear the little fellow's actually grown another inch. Dolly had taken the handsomely crafted axe from his belt. You'll need this, he told Tarin, and it should serve you well in many tasks. It's fair folk quality, my lad, and you'll not blunt it easily. It can serve me no better than did its owner, Tarin replied, cra clasping the dwarf's hand, and its metal cannot be as true as your own heart. Good old Dolly. Huff, <laughs> the dwarf's. The dwarf snorted furiously. Good old Dolly! I've heard that somewhere before. Ka, on Dolly's shoulder, bobbed up and down while Taran gently ran a finger over the crow's sleek feathers. Farewell! Cockrook. Taran! Farewell! Farewell to you, Taran answered, smiling. If I have despaired of teaching you good manners, I have rejoiced in your bad ones. You are a rogue and a scamp and a very eagle among crows. Lion had padded up to rub her head affectionately against Taran's arm, which she did so vigorously that the enormous cat nearly knocked him off his feet. You're my friend, good company, Taran said, stroking Lion's ears. Cheer him with your purring when his spirits are low, as I wish you might cheer me. Stray not far from him, for even such a bold bard as Fluid or Flam is no stranger to loneliness. 
Lueter himself had drawn near, and in his hand held the harp string he had taken from the fire. The heat of the flame had caused the string to curl and twine in a curious pattern that seemed without beginning or end, constantly changing as from one melody to another, even as Taran looked at it. I am afraid that's all that's left of the old pot, Fluiter said, offering the string to Taran. Truthfully, I'm just as well pleased. It was forever jangling and going out of tune. He paused, glancing behind him nervously and cleared his throat. <coughs> ah, ah, what I mean to say was that I shall miss, the, miss those snapping strings. No more than I shall miss them, Taran said. Remember me as well and fondly as I remember you. Have no fear, cried the bard. There's still songs to be sung and tales to be told. A flam never forgets. Mm, alas, alas, wailed Gurgi. Mm, poor Gurgi has nothing to give kindly master for fond rememberings. Woe and misery. Even wallet of crunchings and munchings is now empty. The tearful creature suddenly clapped his hands together. Oh, yes, yes! Oh, forgetful Gurgi has one gift. Here, here it is. From burning treasure house of wicked death lord. Bold Gurgi seized it with catchings and snatchings. But his poor tender head was so filled with fearful spinnings that <laughs> he forgot. With this, Gurgi drew from his leather pouch a small, flame-scarred, battered coffer of unknown metal and held it out to Taran, who took it, studied it curiously, then broke the heavy seal which kept it locked. The coffer held no more than a number of thin, closely written parchments. Taran's eyes widened as he scanned them, and he turned quickly to Gurgi. Do you know what you have found? he whispered. Here are the secrets of forging and tempering metals, of shaping and firing pottery, of planting and cultivating. This is what Arryn stole long ago and kept from the race of men. This knowledge is itself a priceless treasure. Perhaps the most precious of all, said Gwydion, who had come to study the parchments in Taran's hand. The flames of Anubin destroyed the enchanted tools that labored of themselves and would have given carefree idleness. These treasures are far worthier, for their use needs skill and strength of hand and mind. Fluider gave a low whistle. Who owns these secrets is truly master of priding. Tar an old friend, the proudest Cantrev Lord, will be at your beck and call, begging for anything you choose to grant him. And Gurgi found it! shouted Gurgi, springing into the air and madly whirling about. Yes! Oh, yes! <laughs> Bold, clever, faithful Valen, and Gurgi always finds things. And once he found a lost piggy, and once he found evil black cauldron. Now he finds mighty secrets for kindly master! <laughs> Taran smiled at the excited Gurgi. Indeed, you have found many mighty secrets, but they are not mine to keep. These I will share with all in Prydain, for by right they belong to all. Eh, then share this as well, said Dalbin, who had been listening closely, and now held out the heavy, leather-bound volume he had kept under his arm. The Book of Three? Turin said, looking wonderingly and questioningly at the enchanter. I, I dare not... Eh, take it, my boy. Dalbin said, it will not blister your fingers <laughs> as once it did with an over-curious assistant pig keeper. <laughs> All its pages are open to you. <laughs> the Book of Three no longer foretells what is to come, <laughs> only what has been. <laughs> but now can be set down the words of its last page. The enchanter took out a quill from the table, opened the book, and in it wrote with a bold, firm hand, and thus did an assistant pig keeper become high king of Prydain. This too is a treasure, said Gwydion. The Book of Three is now both history and heritage. For my own gift, I could give you nothing greater, nor do I offer you a crown, for a true king wears his crown in his heart. The tall warrior clasped Tarn's hand. Farewell, we shall not meet again. Take Drinwen, then, in remembrance of me, Taran said. Drinwen is yours, Gwydion said, 
as it was meant to be. Yet Arn is slain, Tarn replied. Evil is conquered and the blade's work done. <laughs> Evil conquered, said Gwydion. You have learned much, but learn this last and hardest of lessons. You have conquered only the enchantments of evil. That was the easiest of your tasks, only a beginning, not an ending. Do you believe evil itself to be so quickly overcome? Ugh, not so long as men still hate and slay each other, when greed and anger goad them. Against these, even a flaming sword cannot prevail but only that portion of good in all men's hearts whose flame can never be quenched. Ilanwe, who had been standing in silence, now drew close to Taran. The girl's eyes did not waver from his as she held out the golden sphere. Take this, she softly said, though it does not glow as brightly as the love we might have shared. Farewell, Taran of Kyr Dolben. Remember me. Ilanwe was about to turn away. But suddenly, her blue eyes flashed furiously, and she stamped her foot. It's not fair, she cried. It's not my fault I was born into a family of enchantresses. I didn't ask for magical powers. That's worse than being made to wear a pair of shoes that doesn't fit. I don't see why I have to keep them. Ah, Princess of Lear, said Dalbin. I have waited for you yourself to say those words. Do you truly wish to give up your heritage of enchantment? Of course I do, Ilanwe cried. If enchantments are what separates us, then I shall be well rid of them. And this lies within your power, Dolman said. Within your grasp. <laughs> and, for the matter of that, upon your finger. Uh, the ring you wear, the gift Lord Gwydion gave you long ago, will grant your wish. What? Ilanwe burst out in both surprise and indignation. Do you mean to say that all the years I've worn my ring, I could have used it to have a wish granted? You told me nothing of it. That's worse than unfair. Why, I could have simply wished to destroy the Black Cauldron or to find Drenwyn. I could have wished Arryn conquered without the least danger, and I never knew. <laughs> child, child. Dalbin interrupted. Your ring can indeed grant you a wish, and one wish alone. But evil cannot be conquered by wishing. The ring will serve only you and grant only the deepest wish of your own heart. I did not tell you before because I was uncertain that you truly knew what you longed for. Turn the ring once upon your finger, Dalbin said. And wish with all your heart for your enchanted powers to vanish. Wondering and almost fearful, Ilanwe closed her eyes and did the enchanter's bidding. The ring flared suddenly, but only for a moment. The girl gave a sharp cry of pain, and in Tarrant's hand the light of the golden bauble winked out. Eh, it is done, Dalbin murmured. Ilanwe blinked and looked around her. I don't feel a bit different, she remarked. Are my enchantments truly gone? Dalbin nodded. Eh, yes, he said gently. Eh, yet you shall always keep the magic and mystery all women share. <laughs> and I fear that Taran, like all men, shall be often baffled by it. <laughs> eh, but such is the way of it. Eh, come, clasp hands, the two of you, and pledge each other your troth. When they had done so, the companions pressed around the wedded couple to wish them happiness. Then Gwydion and Taliesin went from the cottage, and Dalbin took up his ashwood staff. We can tarry no longer, the enchanter said. And here our ways must part. But what of Henwin? Taran asked. Shall I not see her one last time? <laughs> as often as you please, answered Dalbin. Since she was free to go or stay, I know she will choose to remain with you. But I suggest you first let those visitors trampling about the fields see there is a new high king in Prydain and a new queen. A Gwydion will have proclaimed the tidings and your subjects will be impatient to hail you. <laughs> the companions following, Tarn and Ilanwe left the chamber. But at the cottage door, Tarn drew back and turned to Dalbin. Can one such as I rule a kingdom? 
I remember a time when I jumped headfirst into a thorn bush, and I fear kingship will be no different. Very likely more nettlesome, put in Ilanway. But should you have any difficulties, I'll be happy to give you my advice. Right now, there's only one question. Are you going in or out of this doorway? In the waiting throng beyond the cottage, Taran glimpsed Heviad, Lassar, and the folk of the comets, Ghast and Gorion side by side near the farmer Adan, King Smite towering above them, his beard bright as flame. But many were the well-loved faces he saw clearly only in his heart. A sudden burst of cheering voices greeted him as he took Ilanwe's hand tightly in his own and stepped through the door. And so they lived many happy years, and the promised tasks were accomplished. Yet long afterward, when all had passed away into distant memory, there were many who wondered whether King Taran and Queen Ilanwe and their companions had indeed walked the earth or whether they had been no more than dreams and a tale set down to beguile children. And in time, only the bards knew the truth of it. Thus ends the Chronicles of Prydain. Join us next time for a series of short stories about Prydain, entitled The Foundling and Other Tales of Prydain.